It is Friday, February 26th, 44 degrees outside, over 60 in the greenhouse, just waiting on the exhaust fans to kick in. This is a sand tray that I set up last year so that the plants that I'm growing in shallower pots or ones that I was having problems keeping up on the watering, I put in here so that Every morning, I water the trees and the tray. So as the year progresses, uh, you end up with some debris and some loss of sand. And what's supposed to happen is the plants are supposed to send their roots into the sand looking for moisture so that when you're not around, they can absorb and uh, not be little brown twigs when you get home from work. So what I'm going to do is pull this tray apart, clean it up, check each plant, see if it needs uh, a root pruning, maybe a little nip and a tuck on the foliage, and then put it back down. So that's the beautiful thing here. So that's taken care of for you. Generally speaking, I don't fertilize the sand, but it does end up attracting weed seeds. My goodness. Woo! Look at you. All right. So, I'm going to put this aside for now pull out some of the obvious weeds and uh, my woods violet just loves loves it here in the greenhouse so don't need them competing for moisture and nutrients with the with the trees so I'll probably have to add a new layer of sand to this, but first we'll clean up, clean up the trees, and then we'll clean up the sand tray. So let's go one at a time here. Where to start? Well, let's start with a wacky one. This is a crazy little. Azalea I acquired many years ago. Uh, it was never doing what I wanted in the bonsai container, so I figured I'd give it a few seasons in a, a nursery pot and let it gain some vigor. I don't know if you can hear it, but the fans just clicked on. So it's getting warm in here. And now the cold air will be blowing across me. I don't know if you caught it, but there's a little touch of root mealybugs on this plant. Now azaleas are quirky. They, generally speaking, are basal dominant, meaning they're stronger close to their roots than they are at the apex of the tree and they are completely dependent on a relationship with a mycorrhiza in the soil and in order to keep that mycorrhiza happy you need to have an acidic pH and you need to make sure the plant does not dry out. If it dries out three times in one season, then the tree will the tree. The azalea will not recover because the mycorrhiza is no longer able to help the plant survive. So you gotta be careful. When you work with azaleas, don't drought stress them. Make sure your pH on your soil is acidic 
and make sure you have organic material for the mycorrhiza to feed on otherwise you're gonna have uh, a lot of disappointing experiences with azaleas all right so we have checked the roots and I need to check the top here I've got new leaves showing new leaves showing I think this part up here is browned out now if I look over here I've got a bud, leaves, not seeing anything here, so do a quick scratch test, doesn't sound good, doesn't look good, so we'll eliminate those, and then work my way down the tree, if you can even call this a tree, because azaleas are really shrubs. All right, so that leaf is alive. That leaf is alive. Doesn't look like anything beyond it is alive. That one's dried out. That looks good. That one's dried out. That one's dried out. That one's broken. And this is a cute little azalea. Small flower, purple and white. Lavender? I don't know. I'm terrible at color descriptions. So, this one is done for the time being. So let's take a look at another one. Now, boxwoods, this is a Kingsville boxwood. Boxwoods are adventures in pruning. And they root very easily. So what I intend to do is collect the cuttings from this and then I'll show you what I've done in the past and what you can do when you run across some good pieces. Boxwood Kingsville is my favorite. Um, I haven't worked too much with the other ones. I've collected a couple over the years from client yards, but haven't really done anything with them. So I think that's on my agenda for this spring is to work on a couple of the collected ones. Now, some boxwoods uh, put off a very, very strong ammonia aroma so don't be surprised if you decide to work with something like a Korean boxwood and you think a cat has urinated on your tree that's just Korean boxwoods being Korean boxwoods I'm not gonna do any wiring on this I'm just gonna snip them back I get my fingers in there. And just think about opening up some spaces in the tree. Again, you can barely call this a tree. This is more like a shrub, but as long as I'm showing a nice big trunk, I can I can call it a tree. I'm not even sure it's a big trunk. So I'm not really paying too much attention to the direction the buds are pointing. I'm more concerned right now with taking the foliage back 
so it's a little more compact. Now, sometimes boxwoods will throw out a reversion, and my understanding is that the Kingsville boxwood was discovered as a mutation on another boxwood. I was taught Korean, may have been a different variety, and the mutation, or the sport, or the witch's broom, whatever it was, was rooted and it's fairly stable. However, Kingsville boxwoods have been known to revert to their parent form where a section of the tree will just start putting out larger leaves and have big internodal spaces. So you need to be aware that the boxwood could do that to you any year that it feels like it. Kingsville boxwood also grows more roots than leaves. So don't be afraid to root prune a Kingsville hard. And by hard I mean 50% of the roots in one setting. Our general guideline is to remove two-thirds of the old soil, one-third of the old roots, refresh the soil, and you check the tree annually. Depending on the age and the vigor of the tree, you either need to do that once a year or once every 15 years. It really depends on the vigor of the tree. Okay, so I know those roots are weird and wrong, but they appeal to me. So not not bad here. No real root bound situation. Bunch of roots running around in circles, so we'll do a snip, comb them out. I like to fluff up the old roots. I don't know if it helps them move into the new soil, but I do it anyway. And now we'll refresh the soil. A little bit of Super Thrive. I always like to use pre-moistened soil, and I was a little lazy here. I didn't pre-moisten the soil before I started filming, and I don't want to stop filming. So now we'll work the roots into the new soil. And when I say soil, I mean soil is media. If you've been watching me for a little bit, you know what I'm talking about. And for those of you who don't, uh, using topsoil went out of favor with bonsai probably, probably 40, 50 years ago. I really don't know. I've only been at it for 30. But my instructor said that we don't use soil, we use a soilless media, and some people like to use akadama, some people like to use kanuma, some people like to use pumice and lava stone. You use what works for you and the tree. Just be aware of moisture retention and the pH. And as long as you're giving the plant what it needs, I bet you could grow it in ground glass and it wouldn't know the difference. Alright, so 
gave him a nip and a tuck. And let's take a look at this crazy. Look at that. This one's crazy. So this is uh, <clears throat> a Cotone Aster. I don't remember which which variety. Not seeing anything in the way of root mealybugs, which makes me happy. Now, Cotone Aster is a relatively short-lived tree, maybe 15 years if you're lucky. So, don't panic if your Cotone Aster starts to fade after 10 or 12 years. I know some artists won't do anything that they can outlive. They only want to work trees that will live longer than them. But I think you need to appreciate the beauty of the tree while it's alive. And bonsai teaches you many things. One of them is the ephemeral nature of life. Nothing lasts forever. So enjoy it while you can. So, the roots went all the way through the drainage holes and were working their way into the sand. So I'm going to comb this down. I already cut off that big chunk that came out of the sand. So I'm going to give this a little nip. And then... We'll go back in the same pot. I don't see a need to change the container on this one. So, a little bit of soil, list media. Some super Thrive. And now, We'll take a look at what this guy's doing. So I have a root coming out of here, a root coming out of here, and a root coming out of here, and a little shoot there. Don't think I need the top one. So I'm going to eliminate that. Don't think I need the second one down. Eliminate that. And the question is, do I hold on to this one for the time being? Um, I'm torn. Kind of like it. Kind of don't. So, since I can always remove it, I'm going to leave it for now. Freshen up the soil. If you ever watched any of... Oh, guess what? Plastic wore out on that one. Ultraviolet radiation and plastic do not get along. So... What was I about to say? Oh. If you've ever watched any of the cooking shows, um, you'll frequently hear a phrase, mise en place, which is French for everything in its place. And when you're working your bonsai, you really need to make sure you're prep is done properly. So make sure your soil's ready, make sure your soil's been pre-moistened, make sure your containers are ready, make sure you have your tools lined up, because um, I hate going looking for stuff and 
it's usually my own fault because sometimes I'm impatient or lazy and I don't line up everything the way it should be lined up. Now, question is, do I need do I need any of these branches? Do I need all of those branches? I would say I need some of them. So I'm not sure I need all of this. So I can root that. I've never tried sprouting cotone ester seeds. I just may I just may give that a go. So that's two, three. Well, I only got four more to go. So this is a small leaf elm. Which one? I do not know. Usual complement of Oxalis. Woods violet. And moss just grows crazy around here. So this is a typical leaf from this variety. Don't know which one it is. But definitely worth propagating. So, tree is doing its own little thing. I haven't wired it, but it's in need of a nip and a tuck. So, got a little congestion up here, which is fairly typical. I think I'm gonna just start over because it's just too clunky, too clubby. Get rid of that big one in the back. Now that one's shooting over there. Don't need all of it. So, if I was really, really ambitious, I would go through every little twig pull out whatever is not needed for whatever design I'm headed at. Right now I don't have any plans for the design on this tree. I'm just gonna keep working the clip and grow approach and see what the tree gives me. Sometimes the trees tell you what they want to be. Alright, so no root millie bugs, which makes me happy. Big piece of root there. This is, should be fairly good about coming up from a root cutting, so I'm going to hold on to those. Ah, look, an earthworm. How they climb up the table is beyond me. I don't know how they do that. I'm sure they do it at night when I'm not around, but how they manage to get up there is amazing. Slugs, I understand. Earwigs, all that all makes sense. They can climb up the legs of a table, but how the earthworms get up there? I don't know. So I have a big knob off that root. So I'm going to take it back. And I can get away with this stuff 
this time of year the tree has no foliage temperatures are still reasonable for the roots to move and I don't have to worry about the foliage coming out although some plants are far more uh, what's the right word willing to emerge early I have some quince that are moving along even in the cold the coldest part of the greenhouse they're just putting out leaves Everybody else is still asleep. So I'm going to go for... I don't want that straight. I'm going to go for an angle like that. A little shake a shake a tap a tap a and a little spray. So for those of you who are familiar with the phrase shake a shake -a and tap a tap -a, let them know about my work and let them take a peek. All right, now this one's really, really funky. I want to say he's a Catlin. Not really sure. Got a really interesting line going on here. I love that contorted trunk. So, I'm going to raise him up, show that off. And then, we need to take back everything that's too long. This branch is much thicker than the ones below it. I'm not sure I like that one. So I'm going to keep the leaf load tight on that one. I'll let this one have some more freedom to do his thing this year. Let that one grow out, and we come to the top of the tree. Too long. He's growing up in the middle of nowhere. Now, let's go up here. Take that back. All right, so I could put another wire on here. Straighten him up. Well, not straighten him up, but bring him up a little bit higher. Maybe bring that down as a branch. I'll think on it. In the meantime, I want to get these roots done. So, they're basically running around in a circle. pretty one-sided. So 
Let's see if I can bring a little something around the front. All right, there you go back in your container. Part of me wants to put this in a bigger container, and part of me wants to leave it here so I can keep the roots close to the trunk. Plus, I'm running out of shelf space. So I have potted a number of plants earlier this year, and I'm rapidly running out of shelf space. Okay. He's kind of crazy. I like him. Now let's see what we got here. It's another one of those dwarf small leafed elms. No root mealy bugs, which makes me happy. Some moss, some grasses, some oxalis. Ah, that's the smallest little Woods Violet. <laughs> Look at him. So I think I have a front hiding in there. Maybe a front in there. And a couple potential fronts, so I don't know who's going to win out. So let's see what I can do. So definitely worth rooting these cuttings. Splits. So if this is the front, I'd want to get rid of everything behind there. If I make this the front. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. So I like the roots on that side. I like the roots on that side. Presents me with a dilemma. So how can I prune this? so that I can appreciate it from both sides? It's a good question. I don't have an obvious answer. So I will have to revisit him later in the year, see what's progressing and where, and then make a decision. You don't have to make all your decisions at once. Trees evolve. Bonsai 
is a four dimensional art. Three of space and one of time. And the plants evolve throughout the course of their lives. Just because you had it looking one way the first year you got it doesn't mean it has to stay that way. And it's not going to anyway. The tree is going to grow, lose limbs, put out new ones. So you'll be on top of it making sure that it's doing something that you find aesthetically pleasing. But bonsai are not done until they are brown and crispy and you can put them in your fireplace. Otherwise they are constantly evolving and you need to work with them so that they evolve in a direction that you like. So this guy has, in my opinion, two potential fronts. I'll have to decide which one I like best. I may end up getting rid of that job of the hut like protrusion along the back and now I have another crazy little one I was working on so not sure what I was thinking with this one except that it was a really small rooted cutting and I didn't want it to dry out have some really, really small elms and even smaller boxwoods I'll be showing you. So, come down here, find the roots. The roots are running laps around the container. So, loosen them. idea where I'm going with this tree. Not a clue. So, I'm going to you can see it thin and then thickens there. This is a Catlin. I have dozens of them. Don't really need any more. Uh, we're gonna put him back in the pot. Get rid of this old soil.
He's either going to be really, really interesting or very, very uninteresting. I don't know which. Time will tell. Time will tell. So, I'm fairly certain that's everybody who was in the tray. Doesn't mean I didn't miss somebody. Okay, this moss is nice. I'm going to save that for you, son. Another planting. So now we... Bring back the sand tray. Get some fresh sand. Even out the low spots. sand and I use pool filter sand I don't use the cheap stuff from the home improvement stores it's too much debris in those bags what I like about the pool filter sand is it's been cleaned it's been screened relatively uniform granules. Alright, so now the next thing I'm going to think about is how this is going to be on the table where the sunlight is coming from. I'm going to put that towards the back which will face west. This will face east. So I'll put my shade tolerant low sun plant in the front. Oh, I did miss one. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. All right. Well, we'll save space for him. And then we'll work our way up. The azaleas are also relatively shade tolerant. him facing east. Catoni asters, I don't know. I always think of them as full sun, but I've seen them grow in shade as well. And settle him in. Let's see. It's giving me grief. Okay. And then we'll go for the elm. So I'm going to put... Actually, you know what? I'm going to change my mind, and here's why. The tall containers... I like in the back of a tray, so that they do not block my line of sight for my smaller, shallower containers. Which I'm likely to overlook if I'm not caref careful when I'm watering. I miss plants all the time when I'm watering, so you really need to stay vigilant and be on top of your game when it comes to watering. So I like to go with the tall pots in the back, short pots in the front,
and I did skip that one boxwood so I'm not sure you guys want to watch me root prune and prune another boxwood so I'm going to spare you watching me nip and tuck the little one and I'm going to tell you all that this is the spot where I'm supposed to say like subscribe questions comments requests you know how it works so do your thing and go out and play with your trees have fun